Very exciting. Right now we're going to talk about um, some RNA targeted therapeutics. So my colleague Liana Orlando is um, the VP of research here at Cure Duchenne. She's also a partner of Cure Duchenne Ventures. She's going to give us a primer, an intro, uh, like Karsten Bonneman did. Uh, and then we're going to go into some of the company presentations. Um, this session, just FYI, is split by lunch. So I really, really encourage you, we're not going to do a Q&A after this one after lunch, but I really encourage you to, to write down your questions and keep them at the top of your mind so that during the exhibitor showcase, all these companies have a booth, or if you catch them around, you don't forget to ask them those questions. Because I know it's really important to kind of get your questions answered on site. So um, without further ado, I'm going to welcome up Liana and the rest of our um, panelists today. Thank you so much. We have a great lineup of talks today before lunch and after lunch, as, as Carrie said. So I'm going to jump right in and you know, give a little bit of a background so maybe we're all starting from a, a, an even playing field, so to speak. So the title of the section is Restoring Dystrophin Through RNA-Targeted Therapeutics. So I thought I'd start with what is RNA. Um, so if you don't know, don't worry, I'm going to get into it in the next slide. But what we're going to cover with these RNA-targeted therapeutics are a collection of different therapies, exon skipping, which is happening mostly with antisense oligonucleotides, a word you're going to hear a lot today. Um, another approach for delivering exon skipping machinery by delivering it via AAV, which is a little bit more similar to what you heard this morning in the, in the gene therapy talk, and some stop codon read-through agents. So these are all different strategies for restoring dystrophin by targeting the RNA. So what is RNA? So our genes, or our genome, is our DNA, which sits in the nucleus of, of our cells, and that genetic information encodes the proteins in our body. So the DMD gene is what encodes the dystrophin protein. And for that to happen, there's this intermediate step where this message or messenger RNA is made. And that can be thought of as the instructions for making the proteins from a gene. And so all of the therapies we're talking about today, I'm going to see if I can get the laser pointer to work. Oh, yeah is targeting sort of these intermediate steps between the DNA and the protein. So somewhere along that way, we're targeting the, the message. And so your original copy of the gene doesn't get changed. So a lot of the talks we're going to hear starting now and then again after lunch are going to be around exon skipping. And so We'll go through what exon skipping is, but you might ask, well, will exon skipping work for me? The first thing is that this is sort of precision medicine, so you need to know what your specific mutation is to know whether or not you can skip around it. And generally speaking, if you have a deletion in an exon that's adjacent to the exon to be skipped, this just might work for you. But to find out for sure, this is something you should be talking with your neurologist or your genetic counselor about. You can also set up a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the Cure Duchenne Caris team, and you know, we can help you know, give you the landscape on that. Uh, we're very fortunate, and we're going to hear from uh, two of the companies that have already have FDA-approved drugs. Um, for exon skipping, and they target three different exons, exons 45, 51, and 53. And then there's many more programs in development. So how does exon skipping work? So what I'm showing in these blue boxes are, can th be thought of as the building blocks of the gene. So exons can be thought of the building blocks. And the DMD gene is really big, dystrophin's really big, and there's 79 exons. 
And I'll draw your attention to the shape of these different boxes because what that represents is the way the coding sequence has to match up exactly at the boundary from one exon to another. So the shapes need to fit exactly together for you to be able to get from the beginning at exon one all the way to the end at exon 79. And if they don't fit, we have a problem. And if you look in this sort of middle column here for Duchenne, in the context, we'll go through an example if you're missing uh, exon 50. In the context of missing exon 50, now the shape of 49 and 51 doesn't match up exactly, and you have this gap. So the code does not actually link up in the way it's supposed to. And so the mRNA reading frame, the messenger RNA reading frame is disrupted, and you don't get dystrophin protein. And so what exon skipping does is say, OK, can we skip another exon and actually make those pieces fit back together? So that's this last column that we're looking at here. So we'll say, in the context of a mutation where you're missing exon 50, if we use something like an antisense oligonucleotide, something that blocks exon 51 from being included, now the reading frame can be restored because exon 49 actually matches up with exon 52 in the right way. And so now you will get all the way from the beginning at exon 1 to 79, but just be missing those two exons in between. And it turns out that that is a, can be a functional dystrophin protein. Nature has taught us um, there's some individuals who have, are missing certain exons that naturally skip other exons and have what's called revertant fiber. They have some dystrophin production, um, just missing little pieces in the middle. And small amounts of that can actually lessen the severity of the disease. So the premise of exon skipping is trying to take what we've seen a little bit in nature and maximize that process. And this exon skipping works not just for single exon deletions. It can work also if you're missing multiple exons all at once. And this is just another example of a two exon deletion if we're missing 49 and 50. Again, 48 doesn't match up with 51. But if you all, sorry, yeah, doesn't match up with 51. But if you also skip 51, now the reading frame is restored and you would get a dystrophin protein, which would just be missing those three exons in the middle. So this is, this is the concept of exon skipping. And um, you can use this sort of puzzle piece of different exons and work through different mutations that are, are prevalent in Duchenne and strategies for whether or not fix, uh, skipping another exon would actually restore the reading frame. And when you do that, you come up with something like we see here, which is, oops, about 13% of Duchenne cases have a mutation which is thought to be amenable to skipping exon 51. And 8% um, of cases would be amenable to skipping 45. So for the drugs that are FDA approved that we'll hear about, we're addressing around not 29% of Duchenne cases. And in general, it's thought that about 80% of individuals have genotypes which would be amenable to skipping in theory. Although as you see, as we get down to sort of the further along here, it's smaller and smaller subsets of individuals. So today we're gonna to hear about drugs that have already been approved as well as others which are, have been in clinical trials and in development. And the, the uh, approach for, um, for these next generation exon skipping drugs is multiple reasons. We're trying to target more exons. We're trying to get more of this therapeutic into the skeletal muscle so that we'll get better at restoring more dystrophin, as well as get that into the cardiac muscle and the diaphragm as well, because that's where a lot of the life-limiting problems of Duchenne happen. And um, as we'll also hear today, 
some of these drugs we might be able to dose less frequently because these are drugs acting at the messenger. They don't disrupt the DNA, but at the mRNA, you have to give the drug over and over with some regularity. And so if we can get people having to come in less frequently for those, those dosings, that would be better for, for everybody's quality of life. So you heard this morning about gene therapy, and a lot of that was focusing on AAV virus delivery of microdystrophin, which at the moment is just a one-time treatment. Um, and I just walked through sort of exon skipping with antisense oligonucleotides, and that, as I said, is a treatment that has to be given regularly over time. So these are two sort of distinct approaches, although as science is evolving, there's actually even some things which fall a little bit in between. And we're going to hear a talk in this session about that as well, where um, Kevin Flanagan will be speaking about using AAV to deliver sort of the machinery to skip um, a particular exon. And so, again, this is a you would give the dose once, but then the cells themselves would make that exon skipping therapeutic over the long term. So we look forward to, to his talk. Um, I, I won't steal his thunder, but it particularly is targeting duplications of exon 2, which represents about 1% of individuals with Duchenne. And um, he's got really interesting data from individuals that have been treating, included, as you mentioned earlier today, you know, a very uh, uh, infant toddler who, um, who had tremendous restoration of dystrophin. And then the last sort of RNA-targeted therapy we're going to hear about today um, is from PTC, which their therapy targets a different type of specific um, mutation, which are nonsense mutations. And nonsense mutations give a premature stop codon in the middle of the RNA. So in this picture, the RNA is sort of shown here kind of in brown, and usually at the end of that message, there's a stop signal. But in the case of a nonsense mutation, that stop signal is in the middle. And so instead of having the full normal protein made, you have it abnormally truncated and doesn't do what it's supposed to do. And so what um, stop codon read-through drugs do is, is actually uh, bind to this machinery and say, ignore that, that premature stop codon, that one that's not supposed to be there. And the goal is then to continue reading the message through and getting the full length uh, dystrophin. And like the antisense oligonucleotides, this is also a, a treatment that has to be administered multiple times over, for therapeutic benefit. So I think that's it for me. Um, Kevin? Yeah. Thank you for that uh, great introduction to exon skipping. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, viral uh, exon skipping, so uh, or vectorized exon skipping, as we often talk about it, using what's called a, a, a U7 small nuclear RNA. And I want to begin. Uh, bear with me for a moment uh, to tell you a little bit why we we began with exon two. Exon two duplications are the most common duplication, but the front end of the gene has some special characteristics that make it particularly attractive for thinking about this route of therapy. And I talked earlier about learning from patient biopsies and so forth. So uh, this example actually drives some of what I'm going to show you later in the data. So if you bear with me, we found a nonsense mutation in exon 1 in a family, in a, in a man who stopped walking at age 70 years. And he had about 15% of levels of a protein that was almost normal size. Then we went on to find five other families across North America who were all related by this. We proved they were related by doing genetic testing. They didn't know they were related. So across the United States, there's a founder allele in which it doesn't interfere with growing up and having a family, and you have muscle aches and pains. And the very worst example we've seen is someone who stopped walking at 70. And we found multiple people walking at 80 with no symptoms, didn't even know they had it. So that protein is sufficient to give us that much function. So the reason I began with that, this is what we call the 413 kilodalton form of it. The reason I began with that because when we worked out why it was doing this, we determined that there's something 
called an internal ribosome entry site, or IRES. And the IRES is found within exon 5, and the protein, the assembly of the machinery to translate from RNA, uh, has where the ribosome gets together and starts translation. That's usually at the front of the gene, but there's an extra site in the Duchenne gene. And we, we noticed that it's active. Anytime we saw something like duplication, I'm sorry, we saw that it was not active when there's a duplication of exon 2. It's active if there's a nonsense mutation exon 1. I just showed you that. It wasn't active in the presence of a duplication, but it turns out it's completely active in the presence of a deletion. Uh, the green box just shows that that activity is sort of total. And then we found patients who have a deletion of exon 2 with no symptoms, something like 60% of their dystrophin levels. So this means if we skip entirely all of exon 2, we make this iris-driven form. If we skip one copy, we make wild-type dystrophin, not a miniaturized dystrophin or not a as typical exon skipped one. So the way we do this is to use something called, we went after this with something called a U7 small nuclear RNA. So this is an RNA that is never translated in the protein. It has a special promoter. It pumps out RNA copies. It's got a usual role. Uh, processing another, another gene, uh, and, and what we do is, the, where it's marked in the yellow box, antisense, we target the exon, we take out what it usually targets, and we put in antisense for our target exon, in this case, exon 2. So this has some advantages. We can target it to whatever exon we want. It doesn't get turned into a transgene, so transgene and product immunity is not a problem. The RNA itself is not immunogenic, and once we put it in, it should be efficiently interfere with splicing. And our vector, our first version of this, and the one we've used in the trial, contains four copies. Because it's very small, we can fit multiple copies into an AV genome. So ours has four copies, two directed toward the splice acceptor site, two directed to the splice donor site. And we've gone on to show pretty thoroughly that this is safe in animal models. These are what we call IND-enabling uh, uh, st studies, and that it's specific. We don't see general off-target splicing effects. That would be a concern. If we put this in and it's pumping out, do we, do we mess up splicing of other genes? And we don't. It's very specific for exon 2. So I'm going to share with you a little bit update on some of the data from a trial run by my colleague, Megan Waldrop, um, uh, at, at, at NCH, um, where we, this was used to treat patients. And in fact, three trace patients were treated. And the production of the virus was limited. We had foundation support for production of the virus. We had enough to treat three boys. And we, I'm going to point out all throughout, I'll talk about the 8.9-year-old, almost 9-year-old boy, 13.7, almost 14-year-old uh, almost boy was treated. And in the end, that left us only enough virus to treat an infant. And that was kind of serendipitous, as I'll show you. So we treated a 7-month-old infant, found because of an elevated CK, tested for another reason. And um, so he was treated at seven months of age at 8.26 kilograms. And I want to show you a couple of pieces of data from them. All of you Duchenne parents know that the transaminases, AST and ALT, are already elevated in boys with Duchenne. They're also things we follow. They track with the CK because they're released from muscle. They're also things we follow when we give gene delivery. And these markers here for AST, ALT all show changes uh, 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 elevations in Duchenne at the beginning, but also sort of spikes when we give the therapy, as we always see with gene therapies, but a decrease. But the striking thing here, though, is the CK values. I want to show you in the bottom right. The CK in all the boys went down remarkably, quite remarkably. And the important one is the infant. So CK varies with activity. That's why we don't like it very much in, you know, every visit your doctor probably doesn't check it. If your son goes to a birthday party and runs around the backyard, it could be five times as much as it was the week before. But in a preambulant infant, there is no activity like that. That's not the case. So he went from about 13,000 at his first screening value, and a year later is still at 1,000. So this is quite remarkable decrease. What's the correlate of this? Well, this is a complicated slide, so bear with me for just a moment. We look at what our U7 is doing in two different ways. What is it doing at the RNA level? How is it engaging at the RNA? How is it changing splicing? And then what is it doing for protein? On the left is the RNA studies. And in the dark bar is the transcript that has complete exclusion of exon 2, deletion of exon 2. The gray portion of the bar is wild type, one copy of exon 2. 
And the white copy is the duplicated, un untreated, if you will, version of the, of the mRNA. And you can see right off the bat that we get both species. We get some with one copy, some with two, zero copies. Both of those are therapeutic. Either we get full-length dystrophin, or we get that 413 kilodalton isoform that we know from big patient families lets you walk until at least age 70. What was striking is, in the infant, at the exact same dose, just how efficient exclusion of exon 2 was. Remarkably efficient, with almost complete exclusion of exon 2. Then when we look at Western blot done in the laboratory of Mike Lawler, uh, a colleague, so this is outside of our laboratory, we saw a really quite striking amount. This is compared, done under the most stringent conditions, I won't go to the details, but a very reliable way with a curve on every blot and so on. We could see that over time, the biopsy went from, at four months, about 70% normal dystrophin levels to uh, almost 90% normal dystrophin levels at the end of one year. So this is clearly a differ differential response between them. We did see dystrophin expression on the order of about 8% on the 8.9-year-old boy. He's still walking quite well. In fact, the, 13, the boy treated at 13.7 with just minimal changes in his, in his, uh, in his uh, protein levels is still walking as well at nearly 17 years old. I want to show you some pictures of this, and I'll concentrate here on the third line. That's dystrophin staining in the first boy. And this is a way we sort of color code it to show intensity on the bottom. And we can see at 12 months, about 44% of his fibers show dystrophin expression. Consistent with what I showed you on the Western blot, the second boy, he's only about 7% of his fibers showing dystrophin positivity. But this is the example from the, uh, from the, the infant. So this is really kind of indistinguishable, nearly indistinguishable from normal dystrophin, uh, no, normal, from normal muscle. Essentially, 99% of fibers with what, uh, what is, uh, actually, I should say here wild-type dystrophin, we have to acknowledge it's a combination of both full-length dystrophin and the 413 kilodalton isoform for it. Either way, it's quite a really remarkable amount uh, of dystrophin for it. And we know that this is highly protective. We know that because I didn't show the slide here, but those markers of regeneration of muscle uh, uh, that we stain for, we don't see underway in that muscle. So, we can conclude that this is the, this is the youngest boy treated for DMD to date, um, and, and we have robust expression of this full-length dystrophin. It's sustained over 12 months. In fact, one could argue it seems to increase over 12 months. We saw no side effects at this dose, no significant side effects at this dose of 3 to the 13th, and certainly further studies are required, including dosing of more infants in particular, and higher dosing in, in, in older boys as well. But it certainly sets the precedent, proof of concept for the, the, that we can reach quite a f high efficiencies of U7 mediated exon skipping. And I'll just close by pointing out colleagues, mostly Dr. Waldrop, my close colleague who was running the trial, and the group who helped us to develop it, Dr. Wen and Dr. Uh, Vulan uh, as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin. Um, that's not my slides. <laughs> I think we are in the wrong session with the following slides, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much, and apologies. Um, Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to provide an update uh, from PTC Therapeutics and talking about the earlier mentioned nonsense mutation read-through therapy. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Christian Werner. I'm working in the Global Medical Affairs team at PTC Therapeutics as the DMD Therapeutic Area Lead and will provide an update on the value for boys with uh, nonsense mutation, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and the treatment of atelurin. So PTC has a long history in working in the DMD space, uh, just uh, celebrating the 25th anniversary. Um, and this is uh, also the time that we have been working in the Duchenne uh, space and um, serving for the 
Duchenne community, community, and there is also a year-long collaboration and support from Kur Duchenne uh, providing early funding for this research. Um, after the early development and discovery of the compound, you can see that the first clinical trials also provided a large amount of the understanding of the natural history um, of the disease. And finally, in 2014, Atelurin uh, received conditional approval in the EU and is subsequently available. In the afternoon, you will also hear in a second talk from my colleague Karen, um, an update about Deflazacort. So atelurin, um, as said, is um, a small molecule for the treatment of nonsense mutation DMD. It's the first and only approved therapy to restore the dystrophy in NMDMD and is available in more than 50 countries worldwide. As of now, it's an investigational drug here in the US. Um, what I'm going to present today is an update on the safety and effectiveness of atelurin. And we can see here there is a huge body of evidence with more than 800 patients being treated in clinical trials. And you see on the left-hand side uh, the overview of the clinical trials. On the right-hand side our um, observational study, the STRIDE registry which all together show a consistent safety profile and treatment effect of atelurin. And I will talk about the most recent studies, study L41 and the STRIDE registry. To start with study L41, study L41 is the largest clinical trial in uh, DMD. We have in this study looked at the safety and effectiveness of atelurin in a phase three placebo controlled trial and saw significant treatment benefit across multiple endpoints. In this, we looked at various populations, first of all, in the overall ITT population, which means that all patients who have received the treatment are included in this analysis. And this is reflecting the broad spectrum of DMD uh, patients and disease stages in of course, ambulatory patients included in the trial. Further, we looked in two subgroups. The one subgroup uh, for patients who have a baseline walking capability of three to 400 meters, since we know that from previous clinical trials, this is a group being sensitive for, to demonstrate a treatment effect over the limited period of a clinical trial. In addition, and defined as the primary analysis population, we defined the population with a baseline six minute walking distance of more than 300 meter um, and used as a second criteria the stand from supine time of more than five seconds and expected this being a more sensitive population which finally when we see the results didn't come true. So we saw a numerical benefit um, in this population while in the other two groups and I show this in a minute we saw significant treatment effect um, delaying uh, and preserving the motor function here. So how does this trial look like? It's a 72 weeks trial, so longer than the previous clinical trials with a um, double blind placebo controlled treatment period of 72 weeks, which is followed by another 72 weeks of open label uh, treatment continuation. What we see today is the data from the 72 weeks double blind treatment period. Um, and we look primarily at the primary endpoint, which is the six minute walking test. So this is how the results look like. Um, we see a significant improvement and preservation in the ambulation status of those patients compared to placebo. We can see here when we look at the rate of decline in the six minute walking distance, we see a 20, excuse me, a 21% preservation um, in the ITT, in the overall, the heterogeneous NMDMD population. And when we look at the three to 400 meter uh, baseline, 
population, we see even a 30% a more pronounced treatment effect consistent with what we have seen in previous trials. Not only the walking capability is important, but also the motor function in the upper limbs. And when we look again in this sensitive population of three to 400 meter, we can see, and the upper limb function is measured here with the performance of upper limb scale, the pull. We see in the three dimensions, we see a significant treatment effect in maintaining uh, the capability for longer in the shoulder and elbow dimension and also in the total score. So it's a first sign that also the upper limb function is being preserved with treatment. Further, we have looked and combined the previous clinical trials all together. So study 07, which was the study leading to the approval, um, ACT-DMD and O41, so three studies bringing together a patient pool of more than 700 patients. And when we combine those statistically, we can see that in the overall ITT population, um, a preservation in the walking capability by 19.3 meters and consistent, which was I've shown before, in the three to 400 meter baseline group, an even higher preservation with uh, almost 35 meters. And given that the previous two studies were 48 weeks in duration, we looked here at the 48 weeks, the first 48 weeks in 041. So moving on from the double blind clinical trial into the observational uh, study, the STRIDE registry, which is a long term real world evidence generating study. And uh, this study started in 2015 to look at the safety and effectiveness of atelurin. And as of January, January 2022, 20, uh, more than 300 patients have been included in this registry with an observational period of at least five years. So the data as of January last year, we can see that the time to loss of ambulation has been delayed by four years in the patients being treated in the STRIDE registry when compared to a natural history cohort coming from the Synergy Consortium. An even later milestone, usually occurring after loss of ambulation, is the decline in the pulmonary function. And also here we can see a difference in favor of the patients being treated in the STRIDE registry with atelurin, um, where the reach of pulmonary milestones here measured by the um, force vital capacity of 60% is preserved and delayed by 1.8 years. To conclude, a quick update on the safety. Overall, the atelurin safety profile is consistent with what we have seen in the previous clinical trials with the number of safety effects being in the same range like the patients being treated with uh, placebo. And uh, the overall, the majority of safety events were mild to moderate. Um, which uh, summarizes in a generally well-tolerated uh, safety profile across the studies. To conclude, uh, I would like to thank, thank all patients and families participating in this clinical trial and all um, the individuals who helped to make those clinical trials um, happen. And with this, uh, I say thank you for your attention. My name is Karin Lucas, and I'm in the medical affairs team at Sarepta Therapeutics. I'd like to thank Kier Duchenne for the opportunity to connect with you today. I'm going to be speaking about our RNA therapeutics. Hopefully you heard my uh, esteemed colleague Teji earlier today talk about our gene therapy. He also had a forward-looking statement, and essentially what this says is we follow the science, and our plans may change based on what the science teaches us. 
At Sarepto, we've been working in Duchenne for over 10 years, and we take multiple shots on goal. We're looking at different ways to address Duchenne, different ways to increase dystrophin protein production. I'll speak today about our RNA uh, platform, looking at exon skipping. Teji spoke earlier about our gene therapy. And then in much earlier research, we also have gene editing programs. For exon skipping, we have two different platforms, our PMO and then our PPMO. So the PMO, or phosphorodiamidate morpholino oligomer, do you see why we call it PMO? is our core exon skipping technology. And as Leanna mentioned, we have three approved products. These target exons 45, 51, and 53. And taken together, that allows us to address approximately 30% of patients in terms of their mutations. As Leanna mentioned, these are mutation-specific therapies. We have three ongoing late-stage studies um, our Essence study in purple is looking at uh, both casimersin and golidersin, which target exons 45 and 53, respectively. Enrollment is now complete for that study. We also have an ongoing and currently enrolling study called Mission, and that is looking at a teplersin at higher doses. And finally, we have our Evolve study, which is actually studying all three commercial drugs and asking the question, can we gain real-world evidence to understand better the long-term impact of these therapies? We wanted to take this opportunity today to address some common questions that we are hearing come up a lot in the community. And so one of the questions is, should I consider delaying treatment if I'm considering a future treatment option? And in many cases, we just want to say that there's no clinical rationale to delay treatment for patients, even if they later want to switch to a different therapy. And another, perhaps somewhat related question, is this question of, do I need to stop treatment for a period of time before I will be able to access a future therapy? And we think this probably comes from the clinical trial requirements. Many clinical trials require that patients stop one therapeutic for a period of time before entering the trial. And the reason for that is that in the study, you want to be really confident that any impact you see is from the drug you're studying, not from a drug that the patient was on shortly before. So there's reason for that in the clinical trials, but in kind of real world setting and commercial setting, there's no reason to have to come off one drug for a period of time before starting another. In all cases, please talk to your physicians um, and get their advice. I spoke about our PMO. We also have our PPMO. That additional P stands for peptide. And our PPMO is the PMO backbone, so our exon skipping, with a cell-penetrating peptide attached. That's what the CPP stands for. And the basic idea is that this charged peptide can increase the amount of drug that gets into muscle. And if we have more drug in the muscle, we get more exon skipping, and we get more dystrophin production. And we've shown that in animals and I'll also share some data next in humans. Another benefit of this increased penetration is less frequent dosing. So in our current clinical trials, we're dosing every four weeks. So this is looking at data out of part A of our momentum study, and it's comparing it to some data um, on a Teplersen. So we're evaluating dystrophin expression as measured by Western blot. You can see we have baseline uh, for all the patients, and that's important to do because there is trace levels of dystrophin of, um, present in most patients. So it's really critical to understand what's that pretreatment level to then know how much are you increasing the dystrophin after treatment. As you can see in yellow, we have our Teplersen treatment, and after 24 weeks of treatment, we see that the dystrophin increases to an average of 0.8%. When we compare this then to our PPMO study in purple, first I'll talk about the 20 mg per kg. We see at an earlier time point at 12 weeks that dystrophin is an average of 3%. And then at the 30 mg per kg at that earlier 12 week time point, we see an average of about 6.5%. So these are small numbers, but this data has us excited enough that we're moving forward with this uh, trial as quickly as we can. And we've now are pleased to say that we've fully enrolled part B of Momentum. 
And our intention, assuming the data is what we hope it will be, is that we will use that data to apply for accelerated approval for SRP 5051. Everything we learn out of these studies is really gonna inform our approach to additional exons in the future. I also want to mention Sereptocyst. These are my case manager colleagues. And Sereptocyst is your you know, personal case manager if you um, are a patient or family that's interested in treatment. These case managers will guide you through the entire process of understanding the requirements for treatment and then also assisting with making sure that you have insurance or some other financial reimbursement in order to be able to access the drug. To learn more, please feel free to reach out to us. You can send us email at advocacy at .com. And then we also have a newsletter if you want to keep up to date on everything that's happening in Duchenne with uh, Sarepta. You can either scan the QR code, or later you can go to duchenne.com and sign up there. And with that, I just want to conclude again by thanking Cure Duchenne and also thanking all of the patients and families who have participated in all of our studies. We wouldn't be here without you. Thank you. Sit. Hi there. Uh, my name is Adam Gold. I'm also part of the Medical Affairs Department for NS Pharma. Uh, and it is my honor and privilege to be here with you guys today um, to tell you a little bit more about Viltepso and his clinical development program. So as you've seen a number of times already today, this is a slide acknowledging the use of forward-looking statements in this presentation. And a little bit about NS Pharma and our parent company, Nippon Shinyaku. So NS Pharma is a wholly owned US subsidiary of a larger parent company called Nippon Shinyaku. Um, NS Pharma is located in Paramus, New Jersey. And our parent company, Nippon Shinyaku, is located in Kyoto, Japan, and has been established uh, in the rare disease industry for over 100 years. So Viltepso is an antisense oligonucleotide indicated for the treatment of Duchenne muscular dystrophy for patients who have a confirmed mutation amenable to exon 53 skipping. Um, Viltepso was approved under accelerated approval uh, and continued approval will of course be um, granted based on the, the results of our ongoing phase three study. Um, the recommended dosing for Viltepso is 80 milligrams per kilogram of body weight administered once weekly via IV infusion over the course of 60 minutes. Uh, and for full prescribing information, you can go to this link at the bottom of the slide, www.viltepso.com slash prescribing dash information. Important safety information about Viltepso. Um, while there were no uh, evidence of kidney toxicity in any of the clinical trials that were conducted, your doctor may monitor kidney health throughout the course of Viltepso treatment. Um, that being said, some of the common side effects that uh, are observed uh, after using Viltepso are in upper respiratory tract infection, reaction at the injection site, and cough and fever. So this is a schematic that breaks down our multi-center two-period phase two open label extension study for Viltepso. Um, as you can see, this is sort of broken up into two components, study 201 and study 202. Study 201 began with randomization and a muscle biopsy to get baseline measurements of dystrophin, as well as uh, baseline measurements for functional assessments. This study 201 began with a four-week safety period that was followed by 20 weeks of access to either 40 or 80 milligram per kilogram um, Viltepso. After that 24-week study period, another muscle biopsy was taken to uh, uh, use for the Western blot result, um, as well as further functional assessments. And at that point, all boys in the study were given the opportunity to uh, either opt out or enroll into a 192-week open-label extension study, um, which all patients did end up doing. Um, a little bit about the, the breakdown of the patients that were included in this study. The boys were aged four to less than 10 years old. Um, like I said before, they had a confirmed mutation amenable to exon 53 skipping, uh, and all were on a stable dose of glucocorticoids for at least three months prior to the start of treatment. So this is an important slide for us as it demonstrates that after 24 weeks of Viltepso treatment, the level of dystrophin protein that's expressed in muscle cells is, rose from about 0.6% of normal dystrophin levels at baseline to nearly 6% uh, after the 24 weeks of treatment. 
Um, this change from baseline was statistically significant, and we noted that all patients, regardless of dose and regardless of starting dystrophin level, did uh, uh, exhibit an increase in dystrophin from baseline. And that data, again, is shown here, broken out into the individual patient profile, and you can see, again, that um, all patients, regardless of their starting point, did uh, exhibit an increase um, at the week 25 time point. So the safety profile for Viltepso during study 201 is shown here. As you can see, the top four items on this list are the four items that I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, so upper respiratory tract infection, reaction at the injection site, cough, and pyrexia. Um, notably, there were no treatment-related serious adverse events, no drug-related treatment emergent adverse events, or discontinuation or death in this part of the study. So then moving on to that second part of the study, study 202, which is the 192-week open-label extension period. Um, again, the, the patients from study 201 all rolled over into this open-label extension period. And uh, we did efficacy assessments conducting, uh, conducted efficacy assess assessments every 12 weeks. And so here you can see data for boys that are treated with Viltepso, shown in blue. And they're being compared to a, an external comparator group um, which is the Synergy uh, Natural History Control Population. And so what you can see is that over the course of the first 109 weeks, performance on time to stand, which was the primary endpoint for this open label extension, uh, remain, remained relatively close to baseline um, for that 109 week period. And while we do see a slight decline in performance after that time point, uh, relative to the Natural History Control Population, this is much less uh, significant. So, um, you can see some functional benefit here uh, across the, the whole four-year time point. And this data is also shown in velocity, as you can see on the right. Uh, one of the other measurements, one of the other functional assessments that we did during this study was to look at time to run walk 10 meters, and overall what we saw was something very similar. Across uh, the first 109 weeks, maybe even out into the 157-week time point, performance remained fairly close to baseline in the boys treated with Viltepso compared to a uh, marked decline in performance that was seen in the natural history control population. And so for the safety profile in terms of this open label extension period, you can see here that no participants experience any treatment, any serious treatment related adverse events, no discontinuations or deaths uh, as well in this, in this period of the study. We did have three participants that reported a total of four serious AEs, but none of these were considered to be related to the study medication. And so as far as uh, support for NS Pharma, we have a couple of different hotlines, one of which is NS Support, which you can uh, contact by dialing 833-677-8778, and that's available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, and they'll be able to help you with anything from benefit verification to things like home infusions and uh, uh, other things like that. Um, and we also have a second number, um, 866 677-4276, which is a hotline specifically related to any questions that you may have uh, regarding Viltepso. And so I'd like to leave you with one final slide, which is our pipeline. Um, I told you about our Exxon 53 skipping compound today, Viltepso, which is commercially available in the United States and Japan. Uh, but we also have several other Exxon skipping compounds that are in our pipeline, which we are excited about. Uh, Exxon 44 and Exxon 50 skippers are the furthest along in their development, but we also have Exxon 45, Exxon 51, and Exxon 55 um, on our radar as well. And then one final comment is just to point out our partnership with uh, Capricor Therapeutics, um, who is working on uh, CAP1002, which is a mutation-independent uh, cell-based therapy, and they are currently conducting a phase three confirmatory trial uh, in both ambulant and non-ambulant boys. And so with that, I will finish up and just say thank you to Kira Duchen for allowing me the opportunity to speak. And uh, if you have any more questions about Viltepso or anything uh, NS Pharma related, please come find me at our booth or anywhere around the conference. We'd be happy to chat more. Thank you. So I know I'm standing between you and lunch, so thank you for bearing with me. I hope it's worth it. Um, so, my name is Ash Dugar. I'm the Chief Medical Affairs Officer at Dine Therapeutics. Sorry, I think I... First, I want to thank Deborah Miller, Paul, Carey, and the entire Kyrgyzstan organization for inviting us to be here today. Um, 
They were an early investor in Dyne at a very critical point in our young life. We've been around for a handful of years and I think we've made great strides because of partners like Kier Duchenne. And it's always a privilege to speak to the Duchenne community. Um, thank you so much for your time and attention. These are forward-looking statements. You can go to our website if you're curious. So I always like to start with this slide. I'm not sure why it's... Uh... It seems to not be going... Can it go back? Can you put it back manually? Are you able to go back manually? All right, I'll give it a shot and just continue here. Um, so for some reason, it's uh, skipping slides. So our, uh, ther our therapeutics are built on the force platform. The, the FORCE platform, platform has been in development for, uh, for about five years at Dyne Therapeutics. And it's really a novel way to be able to develop and target antisense oligonucleotides to the nucleus to attack the genetic basis of disease. So in the case of, of uh, Duchenne, we have a platform that has an antigen binding fragment. So if you think about an, a monoclonal antibody, what we did is we took a portion of this monoclonal antibody called a FAB or an antigen binding fragment, and we've engineered it to bind tightly to something called the TFR receptor, which I'll get to on this slide in just a second. The use of the TFR receptor is really interesting because it's ubiquitous. It's highly expressed across skeletal muscle, including diaphragm and heart. And as Liana pointed out, a lot of the other modalities are unable to penetrate the heart and get into the diaphragm uh, a little bit. Thank you. So what you see here is we took that portion called the FAB, and the whole goal of using this approach is to target and improve delivery of axon skipping drugs to key muscles with limited off-target effects. So really targeting the muscles that you want without going into those other organs like the, kiver, or the like liver, kidney, and spleen. We then have this linker, this burnt orange string you see here at the bottom, which is a clinically validated linker. And what I mean by that, it's used in products that are on the market today. And this really enables precise connection of the FAB to the antisense, in this case, the PMO. And we've designed a PMO to, to uh, skip Exxon 51 to restore the reading frame. And Liana gave, gave a great uh, description about how Exxon skipping works. So Dyne 251 is our investigational medicine. And really, we've addressed, we've designed this particular uh, drug to improve the delivery of the PMO to those key muscles like cardiac, skeletal, including diaphragm, and also allow for increased time between doses. Just a little bit more about the mechanism. So here you see on the left-hand side the cell membrane with the transferrin receptor, the TFR receptor, uh, located on it. So the force conjugate binds to that TFR receptor and it's pulled into the cell. And then what you have is the antisense oligo or the PMO escaping within the cell and traveling to the nucleus to be able to target the genetic basis of disease. And so this gives us a pretty unique profile for, you know, that we believe will lead to durability and also wide safety margin. So we've done a lot of work before we entered the clinical trial. We've done a number of studies in models available to us. On the bottom row, you can see we've gone into patient cells. In the middle, we've gone into the MDX mouse, which you heard about a little bit today, which is an exon 23, thank you, an exon 23 mutation. And we've also used something called the D2 MDX mouse. And this is really interesting. Um, it's not often used, but it's a mouse model that has more severe fibrosis, more, you know, sort of it's further along in the, in the progression of DMD, if you will, so a more severe phenotype. And we've also gone into NHPs or non-human primates or monkeys to be, able, to be able to look at exon skipping as well as safety and tolerability. So very briefly, that's it. That's the talk. Thank you. I'm not sure why, uh, why we're...
All right. I'm going to go without slides. So we, um, we published a paper, Nucleic Acids Research, with a lot of our preclinical data. And the slide that I had here in particular was just a snippet of that data. And, and basically, we looked at the quadriceps, the diaphragm, and the heart. And we gave a single dose of our forced conjugate in the MDX mouse. And we looked at dystrophin and localization of the dystrophin to the muscle membrane. And you heard a little bit about that earlier from Dr. Flanagan. What we showed is about 50% dystrophin restoration in the quadriceps and between 80 and 90% in the, uh, in the diaphragm in the heart. We're really pleased to see that kind of penetration after just a single dose, and we evaluated the animals four weeks later in those key muscles. We also showed between 70 and 80% po dystrophin positive fibers, meaning we were able to get the dystrophin to the muscle membrane. So that gives us confidence in the function that we hope to see. And then the other slide was on the D2MDX mouse. And that's particularly interesting because we're able to show that we can actually change the trajectory of fibrosis occurring in that mouse model. And, and that particular slide was in the quadriceps. So we are really pleased to see with early as well as late treatment with our forced conjugate in that severe DMD phenotype mouse model, the ability to change the trajectory of fibrosis. We also did a lot of work in monkeys to be able to look at robust exon skipping between uh, 40 and 50 percent exon skipping in the diaphragm and heart, and also robust skipping in the, in the quadriceps. And we also showed in two GLP TOC studies that it was uh, safe and well tolerated in monkeys. All of this gave us confidence to move into the clinic. Before moving into the clinic, after we did those studies, as we were doing those studies, we reached out to key opinion leaders like Dr. Flanagan, uh, neurologists, cardiologists, pulmonologists, physiatrists, PTs, to give us input into the clinical trial design, the clinical study protocol, the outcomes we should be looking at, the biomarkers, functional assessments, safety assessments. And also, we help, they helped us extract learnings from the natural history that's out there. Because we need to be able to understand the natural history to design our trial and contextualize the data that we generate. And importantly, we also did advisory boards with patients, young men, as well as caregivers of young boys, and got great input from advocacy leaders around the world, such as from Kier Duchenne and the Duchenne Community Advisory Board, comprising of uh, over a dozen advocacy leaders in Duchenne from around the world. All of this informed our trial design and also helped us think through how to minimize the burden on families if they were to enter our trial, as well as how to think about the, uh, the clinical trial protocol, the visit schedule, and what kind of education and support we should be giving. So then we decided to construct the design in, the, in, this, in this way, and we've actually been dosing patients uh, globally already. So we're really happy to say that we started pa dosing patients globally, and we will have data in the second half of this year in the form of safety, tolerability, as well as dystrophin by Western blot. So at a high level, our clinical trial design has four periods, a six-week screening period to make sure that everybody meets the inclusion-exclusion criteria, a 24-week multiple ascending dose placebo-controlled period in which participants receive either Dine 251 or placebo every four weeks for 24 weeks, followed by an open-label extension period of 24 weeks in which everyone gets active treatment followed by a 96-week long-term extension period. And again, we're looking at safety, tolerability, and dystrophin as our primary endpoints. But we have several measures of function to be able to understand lower limb function, upper limb function, cardiac function, and pulmonary function, as well as quality of life. So we really want to think through, in this phase one, two study, we want to learn as much as we can. And this is potentially registrational. Finally, we have some very key inclusion-exclusion criteria. I want to point out that this is a study that is wide. It serves patients who are 4 to 16 years of age, both ambulant and non-ambulant, who are amenable to exon 51 skipping therapy. We do allow prior exon skipping use with a 12-week washout, and we don't allow prior gene therapy use. So we are really trying very hard to be expansive and serve uh, the needs of the entire community in this study. So that was my last slide, I think. Uh, and with that, you know, thank you so much. We can only begin to understand the sacrifices that you've made for decades to be able to advance all these therapeutics that, that have been talked about today and that will come up in the next section. Uh, so thank you so much, and I uh, appreciate your time.
Ash, I'm so sorry for the technical difficulties with the slides. It's, it's not a prank, I promise. And it's something I would do, but it's not. Um, okay, so we're going to, thank you so much to everybody for the informative presentations. Thanks, Liana, for the primer. And I know that you'll be here um, for most of the day, and most of you have booths in the exhibitor showcase. We are going to break for lunch. We're gonna take about 45 minutes here, so grab some food. Um, and please, families, visit our time capsule booth. It's in Pacific Ballroom 14, right next door. We wanna hear from you, we wanna hear your stories, and it turns into a really special video. So I'd love it if you participated. And have a great lunch. We'll see you back soon.